Um, thank you so much for coming out today to our Native Voices Lecture Series. I'm Joan Gregory from Echo Cell Sciences Library, and um, <coughs> we have um, a whole series of lectures that um, are coming up, and I, you'll have a chance as you go out to um, find a, the brochure and information about that, information uh, about the American Indian Health information that's available from the National Library of Medicine. This is all part um, of an exhibit that the National Library of Medicine has placed here um, starting September 1st and going through November 8th. And we're really excited to have this exhibit um, after the presentation. You can go downstairs to the main level of the library, just that way and down the stairs, and you'll find uh, the Native Voices exhibit. And if you go to the right, you'll find the massage section um, where they're doing massages today until 2 o'clock. So, you know, there's all sorts of things that you may not have ever <laughs> expected to find in the library. That um, today we um, are very, very lucky to have um, Phyllis Nassi and Lynn Hall. And um, they are here from the Native American Outreach Program at the Huntsman Cancer Institute. And both of them have a significant amount exper of experience um, in this area. Uh, Lynn has um, been there for 13 years now in her 14th, and Phyllis for 14 years now in her 15th year. So um, a lot of uh, great experience. Um, Phyllis has traveled extensively throughout the United States, Alaska, Canada, and Australia to educate her Indian brothers and sisters and researchers working with indigenous people. Um, about the importance of risk reduction, early detection, participation in clinical trials and cancer research, and understanding the future, for example, of targeted therapies, pharmacogenomics, and immunotherapy. And Lynn, um, and uh, both of them are enrolled members um, in uh, various tribes, Phyllis um, Cherokee and Lynn Klamath. 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 And, um, Lynn is a descendant of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, and she received her uh, degrees in health sciences and her master's degree in social work. For the past 12 years, she's um, worked with, well, so 13 years yeah. now, as an update on the flyer here, um, assisted Phyllis in the implementation of outreach initiatives to provide um, culturally sensitive cancer education, prevention, and screening information to <coughs> underserved populations. So, um, without further ado, um, Phyllis and Lynn will be talking to you about cancer in Indian Country, HCI Native American Outreach. Thank you, Joan. So, cancer in Indian Country has, has been evolving for a very long time. It's changed from what we did 15 years ago to what we're doing now. Because when we first started the program, we couldn't even say the word cancer. We couldn't get people to talk about it. And so our method really was getting to know the communities, going back to the communities, being involved in their events so that there was a building of trust. This presentation is going to really take on about four elements so that we keep in, in contact with what the exhibit's doing. And I never know when we do this what my audience is going to be made of when, it's, when I'm called to something like this. So I always give a brief history. And the context is going to sort of go with what Native Voices is, is doing. The um, exhibit focuses really on um, unresolved grief and tr and trauma experienced by the Native American since contact. And if you don't know what that is, it is something that affects your emotion, your psyche, and it's carried through a lifespan. We, in our culture, our oral, our ancestors, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, we have had the opportunity to be told what happened to them. It's not taught like that in the history books. And so we have this hurt and pain 
that has been carried on. That continues to this day because, I say this because when you think about it, you think about it as something that happened a long time ago. My mother was not born a citizen of this country, nor my father. And so it's as recent as that. It's not a long time ago. Our history is very recent. It started with our Indian lands being taken, us being put on reservations. This is a current map of today. It also was encompassed in the boarding school experience. And when our grandparents were taken off to boarding school, and even to this day when they're sent to boarding school, although the intent was to assimilate us into a, a, a non-native culture, what it also did was teach us not that we didn't have the parenting skills that were handed down within our communities. And then when we came back, we didn't know how to parent. And so not having that skill, then it went on to our parents and our parents learning and figuring out what to do in a native context, having come from a non-native context, trying to parent their children into a native context. And so you can see how difficult that can be. The boarding school system, 1870 to the present, it really was attributed to Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny was Andrew Jackson who essentially said, we want the land, go out and do whatever you have to do to get it. Mission was to educate our children into the European language. Let's see if it works. It works. <laughs> now what is significant about this is this is how we arrived at the boarding schools. We have a culture, and I speak from a Hopi perspective because that's really where I grew up, of our hair and before we're initiated we, you know, we carry a feather in our hair and it's long, we don't cut our hair. A process takes place even if we do cut our hair. For example, when my mom died, there was a ceremony that was associated that there was a reason for it. But becoming this was very traumatic. For separation from communities, there was a lot of physical, sexual, emotional abuse by the caretakers. We were exposed to infections that we had never had before. There is the myth that the army forced us to take blankets with smallpox. Research is showing that it was really fur traders who had these blankets who came and who distributed them. And we also endured this huge decimation of our people through that. And so then the question is, who's Indian? Because that leads, just even within our own communities, to a lot, of, a lot of question about benefits. Because now we're talking benefits. Now we're talking casino monies. We're talking all kinds of things. The tribes establish membership three ways. One, they can bring anyone into the tribe that they want and, and determine that they are a member of that tribe and eligible for all of those benefits that those tribal members are, are eligible for. They did this, the Crow, with President Obama. And then there are those tribes that continue to follow what the federal government established a long time ago, which is a blood quantum system. This blood quantum system has resulted in us, for example, in my tribe, this is, my, this is where I am enrolled, of my son now not being eligible because he's not quite a quarter. The tribe decided, because we're losing all of our, our young people and they're no longer tribal members, to change the eligibility of that blood quantum. In some tribes, the blood quantum they raise it so they don't have to distribute funds. So it's a, it's, it's a system that we, we as Native people never really had, but we have adopted for the same reasons the federal government did. Then 
there's descendancy. I'm also Cherokee. Um, sorry. I'm also Cherokee, and in order to be a member of the Cherokee tribe, you have to prove descendancy. It's not a matter of blood quantum. That's why you've got all these people running around saying that they're Cherokee, because they can actually trace themselves back to Cherokee ancestry. In our tribe, it's a way of life. It's not a degree of blood. Our culture, our traditional Indian medicine, spirituality, and healing. What Lynn and I do is we incorporate this when we go to see the patients who are in the hospital. And when we talk with um, the researchers and the doctors, they come with us to the sweat lodge. They learn that when they call us that sometimes, this doesn't have a pointer, maybe it does. Uh, yes, it does, but I don't know if you can see it. So there's the corn pollen that growing up on the Navajo, um, a man named Anina Tanaba, who was a friend of my father's, we got up every morning before the sunrise, and he would say prayers and use corn pollen to bless, and we were supposed to run. I never understood that, and you know, I did for a while, and because I wasn't Navajo, Andy never really got after me. But we still use corn pollen to this day, our program. We also use sage. This is also cedar being burned. This is lavender. I never knew about lavender really until I came to this part of the country. But they use lavender as well. And then our eagle feathers and our eagle wings that carry the smoke that bless us when they touch us. Is that white sage? Pardon? White sage, did you say? You know, I don't know what kind of sage it is. It's not mine. We respect our traditional practices that contribute to our survival. I have had some of the patients come in, and before they start treatment, they want to go home, and they want to do, cere whoops, they want to do ceremony. And so we work with the doctors. Now they pretty much understand that the Huntsman Cancer Institute, that they may ask to do this, and so they determine how, and this is going to fit in the herbs that they take, or that they're given for the traditional Indian medicine, and how that really will work with cancer treatment. Blessings. This is a patient being blessed at the Huntsman Cancer Institute. These are our medicine people that we bring to the Huntsman Cancer Institute. These are some of our fellows who have, who had a, a keen interest in wanting to work with us and our native people. And one of our medicine men said, okay, you come. Come into the sweat lodge. We will work with you. Let's put everything in, into the sweat lodge. And they came with us up to the Wind River Indian Reservation. They came with us to go shoot, and they went with us on all of our, our tours in um, Alaska because the cancer, the colon cancer incidence rates in Alaska are extremely high. They do not have enough trained people to be able to do the scopes or the colonoscopy. And so the, when we were doing this, and when, the, when these fellows, oops, when these fellows went up with us, some of the waiting with symptoms, symptomatic, was 18 to 24 months before they even got a scope. So they would go to the clinics with us. They would work with Dr. Burt, who was back here in Salt Lake City, and they would do the scopes, help with a training that took place in Alaska so that nurse practitioners could actually do the scopes under the supervision of a, uh, um, someone who was a GI doctor. Our culture, we have a deep respect for our veterans. The veterans are, the Native Americans per capita have the highest service in the armed forces. That's my mom, that's my dad. I come from a military family, my grandparents on both sides. My mom, my aunts, my brothers, my sister and I and my son are the only ones in three generations that have not served. And if he's called, I'm taking him and running. <laughs> he's 28. I don't know if he'd run. Our culture. This is a Hopi calendar. We are in October. Whoops. We are in October. That's when the Women's Society dances are taking place, the Kachina dances. 
Well, this is a Pichaco at Fajara Butte. This is the winter solstice. When the winter solstice happens, these rocks are aligned in such a way that they, they touch the edges of this coiled petroglyph. In the summertime, the summer solstice, it goes right through the middle. And when I was little, I used to play up there. Our culture, there's throughout many of the tribes, a belief in an unseen power and that everything has a spirit and that they're all related. And spirituality in a, whole, in a holistic perspective is very tied to our health. This is a comparison of our traditional native culture. Particularly, it's, it's, a, it's a real blessing on the reservations and when we're raised this way, that we're cooperative versus competitive. We have a group tribal emphasis versus, versus freedom and progress. Extended family uh, are important. Modesty versus sexy patience. It's sort of offset because of uh, the computers. A respect for age versus a respect for youth. Um, we have spirituality versus an external conformity. Indirect criticism versus direct criticism. And a harmony with nature versus a conquest of nature. Demographics. There currently are 556, 66 federally recognized tribes there's 100 state recognized tribes. There's over 200 that are waiting for federal recognition. And we speak over 217 different languages with different dialects. On Navajo, 75% of the elementary youth speak Navajo at home. Um, there are 334 federal and state re reservations. 41% of us live in the West. 33% live in the South. Nine in the Northeast, 17th in the Midwest. This is what is very, impo whoops, very important. I'm never gonna get this button right. And most people don't realize this, that over 78% of us do not live on a reservation. That creates a problem because um, when we do Indian Health Service and we're getting health care for the people on the reservation, that includes these people who are, one, who access the services, and some of us who are enrolled. There's a percentage that space. But all of that money goes to the tribe. Some of it goes to the clinics. And so you have many, tr many tribal members who are in urban areas who have difficulty getting access to care. Largest tribes, Cherokee, Blackfeet. And this is where we are. Most people don't realize where, where the largest congregations are. California is host to more Indians in the nation. Then Oklahoma, then Arizona, Texas, whoops, New York, New Mexico, Washington, North Carolina, Florida, and Michigan. This was very surprising to me. I did not think of the distribution like this. But then, working in cancer, I have learned that our cancers are also geographical. They're not necessarily within the tribe. And so when you take a look at this and you compare what those cancer incidence rates are when it comes to geography, it makes a lot of sense. We grew, we were the fastest growing population between 2000 to 2010. We grew by 27% versus nine of the rest of the population. We tend to be a young population with a median age of 29, as opposed to everyone else who's 37. 28%, about one in four of us, live in poverty, compared with 15% of the US population. And we are poorer than the rest of the population, with a median income 
of 35 versus 50. What these demographics show is the population that you're dealing with and how um, the comparison is and the lack of understanding from a health science perspective of actually who you're dealing with. Because you think of the reservation, but you don't think that 78% of this are these people who are in urban areas. No health insurance, 29%. And our infant death mortality is eight per thousand live births versus 6.8. We are equivalent to some of the, of the people in Africa. They don't realize that there are third world conditions in this country, in Utah, and we're flying off to South America, we're flying off to Tibet, we're flying off on all these other places when actually we could do some good here. A third of all the non elderly live in these six states. We are less likely to have access to employer um, health insurance because we're taking low wage jobs or we carry several jobs part time so we're not eligible. You can't, you, so you don't have a family member because most of the families have fewer ties to the workforce. So a family household may not have access to the workforce and so that entire family goes without health insurance. Relies on state aid. <coughs> Current health status. We have high rates of chronic condition. Conditions, we experience some of the worst health outcomes of preventable conditions. We have among some of the highest rates of diabetes and obesity. More than a quarter are current smokers, which is a higher rate than any other racial or ethnic group. About one in five are binge drinkers. Chronic liver disease is four times greater in our population. And that puts us at a significant risk for liver cancer. We're the only population where chronic liver disease is one of the 10 leading causes of death. When something that doesn't always get talked about is mental health. You will see often in the newspaper when our youth commit suicide, then there's a big sort of trying to understand why. This has been going on since, when did Anne go to Washington? And she's from the Wind River, 1986, Wind River Indian Reservation. Was she, was she a student at the time, or was she a teacher still? Senior. And so we've been trying to do something, at least the people we know, since 1986. And so, 23, and this is, these are the people who actually go to the, goes to the services and admit this because it's not something that we do. You know, when, when something is going wrong in our lives, you went to live with, my, my son would go live with Auntie Phyllis and Auntie Phyllis would, would get him, you know, put him on the right path and if Auntie Phyllis did, Uncle Carl would. Um, we had different kinds of families. So we have reported 23% rates of feeling anxious or depressed and 40% inactivity. Unintentional injury is the third leading cause of death and almost half of these unintentional injuries are the direct result of motor, motor automobile accidents, which means also they're drinking, driving, drugs because 50% of those motorcycle accidents are due to alcohol. This happens to be um, Gallup Medical Center. That's my son. He was there doing trauma, doing some trauma work on the weekends so people could take the time off. And what's lovely about this is my father helped build that hospital. So we're trying to get him in the pipeline. Nari, we have a program here where we put them in the pipeline, it's been extremely successful. Um, so we have more deaths compared to all races. 500% more in alcoholism, I won't read them all to you because you can see this. What is very interesting that is not on this slide is cancer. Because cancer, whoops, 
cancer is now the leading cause of death of American Indians and Alaska Natives. So what does that say? There was this big push for a very long time about diabetes. It worked. The outreach worked. Whatever they did, it was working and was moved into a population that is more educated, that has a little more understanding, that is a little um, more aware of what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. And we need to do this with cancer. Currently, there is no funding available for outreach for programs like ours. We are privately funded. We have funding from um, the Huntsman Cancer Institute. If we didn't get the public funding, Hunts Huntsman would pick us up. We are a line item. We are not based on grants. But DHHS changed the way that they were going to, that they were funding programs. And so you, we lost all of these uh, CIS, what was the Cancer Information Services, that changed. We don't have that anymore. You don't have funded outreach programs anymore. Um, and it shifted to the tribes. And the tribes and their clinics and the money that they're using for clinics, they have very different goals because they have to look at, it, at their entire population and serve that entire population. But yes, as of 2013, unfortunately, cancer has become the number one killer of Native Americans. We have the poorest five-year survival rate and seven of the 10 most common cancers. What does that mean? We measure survival in cancer in five-year increments. And so we generally don't make it to the five-year increment. Why? Because we don't come in. We don't do screening. When we show up, we end up with um, stage three, stage four metastatic cancer or funding changes. We were just down at the Wallapai and went, went in to talk to them about what we wanted to do. How, we, you know, what, how could we help them? And when they expressed what their cancer incidence was of the Wallapai, of the 18 um, cancers that they had, 17 were stage four metastatic. And why? They told us that um, IHHS has changed its policy and so now everything is only life and limb. So you have to be dying, you have to be losing a limb before you get treated. Alaska, natives are among the racial groups which have the highest mortality rate for all cancers combined in comparison with other. Alaska is a huge country in and of itself. But they have put in a polycom system. They have changed their laws so that women, this was what was wonderful because we were there at the time, the women who knew how to, how to butcher the animals, they knew where all the organs were, they knew how to sew them up, they knew how to take care of, how to do these things. And so they put them in charge of the um, first contact trauma. And so it, was, it, has, it has changed tremendously. They're doing a much better job. They were, at that time, the only state that I know of that allowed that to happen. You didn't have to have medical training. You had to have traditional training. You had to have traditional Indian medicine, which in Alaska they do have. <coughs> Top 10 in men, prostate, lung, colon. Top 10 in women, breast, lung, colon. Top 10, top three, sorry. And in Utah, in this slide, 76.4 is our incidence rates in Utah. And we are, how many, 36? 39,000 tri tribal members. What is wonderful about us is that we tend to either go home or we go to centers like on Lynn's Reservation. We're, we're going to move to Oregon and go back to Lynn's Reservation be and, and because they have homes now on reservation land where they can go and stay. 
but we tend to um, have end-of-life care in our homes. Huntsman Cancer Institute Outreach Program. I'm going to let Nan do this because she's the best outreach worker there is. <laughs> You're going to have to probably look at the slides. Yeah. Hang on. Thanks, Phyllis. Yeah, you can just hold that. All right, so Joan gave us a great introduction at the beginning, and um, we work at Huntsman Cancer Institute uh, for Native American Outreach. And the mission of Huntsman Cancer Institute is, has really three folds. The first one is research, where they're trying to, we're trying to understand cancer from its beginnings and to use that knowledge for improvement of treatment and care. The second fold is, is for patients, to relieve the suffering of patients. And the third fold of the mission is where Phyllis and I come in, under education. And that's where we try to educate the public about cancer risk prevention and care. And Let me make an addendum to that. That's where they started, is that. Now, we're involved in research. We're involved in patient care, yes. as well as education. Yes, 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 we do. We do get to visit a lot of patients, and it's one of my, it's, 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 it's an amazing part of the job. And um, what do we do for Native American outreach? Well, we develop and assemble culturally appropriate materials for um, cancer to, to educate about how to reduce cancer risk. Now the pamphlets that we've developed, and we have them up here on our, on our little booth, they're exactly what, what every other pamphlet would say, except for we have native, we have native feathers or uh, traditional dancers or regalia, so, so that it makes it more enticing for our natives to, to pick up these brochures and to actually read them. We also have um, native specific incentives like bears and buffaloes and beadwork and medicine bags that we distribute to our, our, our participants who come. And, um, and then this is something that, that um, we did with, with the Department of Health and with Love Communications. It was a big, huge campaign on um, using tobacco wisely on reducing, reducing tobacco risks. It was, it was statewide. Yeah, and so we had billboards and posters and, and all of this is on our website and so you can download these posters free of charge. And so some of the activities that we do up at, at Huntsman Cancer Institute, uh, we attend a lot of health fairs through, through um, tribal organizations, through um, we do cancer presentations, we attend conferences, and we attend meetings. This is Phyllis at American Cancer Research, American Association for Cancer Research, giving a poster presentation. Um, conferences, we travel to powwows, we travel to um, softball tournaments and, and different Indian organizations, just to get the word out as much as possible. Um, we also consider ourselves cultural breakers, brokers. brokers. International Rural um, Health Network is one, th one um, that I'll be talking about at the end of my presentation. Like Phyllis had said before, we take our fellows or we take our health care providers into ceremonies that when, when they want to participate or they want to help our Native Americans. Um, this is a Sundance chief that we've worked with quite a bit, James Trosper. And then when we, we do our patient visits, um, it's, it's really an honor to work with our patients and when they ask for songs of healings or Sundance songs and we'll bring in Sundance singers to, to sing to the patients. We use um, cedar. Um, we've been asked to go up into the mountains and pick our mountain cedar, our Sundance sage. We've been asked to um, bring traditional healers to do um, blessings, to, to do hand healing. We have Lacey Harris, Northern Ute, who does hand healing every Tuesday up there for our Native patients and non-Native patients too. And so this is something that we um, really appreciate. 
we not only work with individuals, with couples, with families, but we work with large groups too. Um, sometimes we, we go to presentations and there's only two to four people there, but no group is too small. And then sometimes we have 50, even hundreds of people there listening. And we're just really honored and grateful to work with our own people. So like I said earlier, we go out to different powwows and different Indian functions to to try to spread the word about cancer risk and prevention. <coughs> and what's important about that site is you see we're actually working also with the caregivers. It's not just patient focused because the patients do have the doctors, they have people who work with them, they do have the social workers and often it's the families that we're called, we've been called in to facilitate. <coughs> I don't know if you're picking me up but to facilitate some, something just for them. Um, we help them find housing so that they can stay here. We help them find food. We, we, are, um, we do a lot of things. We do whatever we're called to do and try and figure something out and work with those who are actually working directly with the patients at the, at the hospital. And we also try to do, do a lot of institutional transdisciplinary collaborations. Um, right here is a picture of Governor Oline Walker, um, prostate cancer proclamation. We got to go to the signing of that. Um, really happy to see Maya here. Uh, we work heavily with Native American Research Internship. NARI program is just amazing that we'll talk about a little bit more at the end of the presentation. What is yes. Native American Research Internship? What is that exactly? Like as in what? The Native American Research Internship is for undergraduate students who are interested in health sciences and they apply, they make application and there's an application process and then they come here for the summer and they work in the labs or in, they work with our physicians and, and oh, with researchers, researchers. and um, it's, a, it's just a wonderful program. We've had quite a few interns apply for school of medicines and be accepted into medical school. And if you want to know more, because she's at Weber State, Maya Holstein is directly from not Weber State. No, she's from Weber oh, State. Weber State, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, That's so afterwards you'll want to you connect with her. Just, I want to talk to you when we're done too. <coughs> good, good. Then, you know, there's been the National Children's Study. We use Angel Flight West a lot because Angel Flight will fly our patients. They also consider us a necessity, and so they have flown us so that we can go to areas like, you know, Navajo Mountain, which at the time had a, <laughs> it had an airstrip where we had to buzz the airstrip to get the sheep and the goats off the airstrip and then turn around <laughs> fast and land. <laughs> because it, it just takes so much longer to get there and they think that what we do is very important. So they support us as well. We've been with the Center of Excellence here at the School of Medicine, um, uh, trying to bring high-risk pregnancy doctors down to Blanding, Utah. So you can see that the scope of what we do and where we go, we get involved, we get started, and then we pass it on because then the relationship has already been built between the School of Medicine, between the hospitals, between the doctors, so that the pathway is there. And they now have cardiologists that go down They've there on a regular basis. Down we did. And we it's, worked off of them. And they have um, high risk pregnancy. It's just pretty amazing. And Sutton Cancer Institute, we actually helped get that started about, oh goodness, 10 years ago I was approached in Alaska at a conference about some concerns of cancer with the Blackfeet. And that when we went down, we learned that the Blackfeet at Browning were actually going across the, the mountains to Kalispell to get treatment, in, which was about five hours away, six hours away, instead of driving three hours down south to Great Falls. And we found out that it was a ask why, and they said because of the way the doctors treat us, because of what they call us. And I had never heard the term prairie nigger before. I did not know what that was, but up above the high line, it's evidently a common term. And so I put into um, a financial aspect of what it was, what they were spending going over to Kalispell, what that clink over there, the revenue that they were getting because of the way they were treating our people. And so they changed. 
They built Sletten Cancer Institute. And they have this huge home right next to it. The now board of directors has native tribal um, executives on it. And it was, it was a long process in coming, but those are the type of also collaborations that we do. People have concerns, they call us. Whether it's for an inherited form of cancer, we help facilitate that so they can get treatment. Whether it's, <coughs> it's, it's you know, racism and discrimination, we try and put things back together so that our people can get health care services. And we do a lot of mentoring. Um, this, the Continuing Umbrella Research Education was a grant, a two-year, uh, two-term grant. six years. We yeah, did. with National Cancer Institute, where we, ha we brought students into our labs to work with our scientists. It was before NARI that we did this. Um, Carolyn Connell with Westminster has this amazing, awesome camp that she does every single summer. She, she specifically tries to go out and recruit Native Americans to come and learn about math and science and the, the importance of it. And so we go and we speak with those, um, those young youth as well. And then, of course, Native American Research Internship, which we can't, we can't talk enough about NARI and how successful that program is. And, and, and part of what the, the reason why they call us is because um, I stress that in the cancer world and in, in the research world and even working in the hospitals, you, a math science background is very important. But you don't have to major in that. There, it takes a lot of different skills and a lot of different kinds of people to be in, involved in research, to work where we work, to do the things we do. It's not all about science and math, so that these young women can see a path that has nothing to do with science and math, but having that background is very important. And then uh, reverse capacity building. This last February, we had an academic student mentoring workshop, and um, we collaborated with Baylor College of Medicine and with Inter. Cancer Cultural Council, of which Phyllis uh, sits on the the, the co-chair for the Southwest Board, and what what we did was um, we went to the Sundance Film Festival. We brought our physicians and our scientists who wanted to collaborate, and our students. We had students from 15 different reservations, or yeah, a, yeah from, those tribes, from those all these tribal. all these tribes right here that were represented, and um, across the country. And we, we, we had them interact in a social interaction like the Native American Reception Forum or a Sundance Film Festival um, event. We went and had lunch and then went to the Sundance Film Festival. And just so that we could teach our, our researchers and our scientists actually how to mentor American Indians and Alaska Natives. We let the kids tell them. We took them out of their white coats and out of their ties. And put them in enclosed situations because the whole focus of the reverse capacity building was changing what's behind the door. Because if I can't change the researchers to understand all of the history, all of the demographics, all of the health status that these kids experience, yes, they have to have the qualification. But behind the qualification, is a, they're dealing with a lot of other things. And if they just interview, keep on their white coat and walk out and think that they don't have to work harder, we are going to lose them. And so it was all about taking that white coat off. And it was so funny because we all had pizza and we were all sitting in a room and one of my, one of my kids came over and said, can I move? And I said, why, what's wrong? Because she won't stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> And so I let her move, and I went and sat down by her, and she said, where'd she go? I said, you need to pay up a little more patience, acquire her voice, she doesn't want to talk all the time, she's just meeting you. And it was a learning experience when we were having pizza, we were all integrated. Then we went to the movie. And what happened? All of the Hudson Research Guide people went to one side, and the students said, what do we do? I said, go sit down. And so I went and stood in front of him and said, you see what you just did? You guys did this. But everything that we talked about and how we were trying to stay together 
and put you out of your environment, put you in the kids' environment, you just walked away from. That was what we were trying to change. Give them the chance to understand. That was the whole purpose of it. And we'll probably do it again. Because the, the researchers loved it. As did the as did the students. A lot of good, a lot of good. Now these are Phyllis is probably she writes so many grants and gets them and and th this is just the success of of her grant writing, quite a few. Right now we're we're working on no evidence of disease and um, we're we're screening a movie called No Evidence of Disease. It's a gynecological oncology movie about gynecological oncologists and the importance if we have a gynecological cancer to be treated by a gynecological oncologist and then um, also it, it gives us um, option to dialogue and open up about different signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer or, or cervical cancer or what have you. Because and it's changing but we did start out like this. We started out telling them. Then we moved into sitting with them. We don't spend a lot of time anymore talking about cancer per se because we talk about risk reduction. We talk about the importance of understanding that when you get there, you're going to hear about clinical trials. We have a movie that we show clinical trials and now we've got a movie where we show the practitioners of gynecological cancers because they're starting to understand and ask these questions about treatment, about precision medicine. They don't know what precision, they didn't know what precision medicine was, but now I'm telling them. We're talking about the human genome. We're talking about how we're changing the face of what cancer is, because we don't even know. It is moving so fast, but our people cannot be left behind. And so we end up talking also about research. And they tell me, it's not the research, it's the researcher. Who do we trust? They trust the science. They don't trust the researcher because of what has happened to us. And that's an important message because it's not just our people. So this program has continued to change and morph. It's continued to look at mentoring and changing what's behind the door, what we talk about. You know, we still will go in and do self-breast breast exam with them and teach them how to do that because after 15 years of this program, every five years we sort of go back and we do a lot of similar things. But in that 15 years, cancer has come from a cancer site, you know, breast, lung. And now it's moving into pathways, which is very different. And national appointments. There's numerous, numerous national boards that Phyllis sits on, and at one time I think she was on 12 boards, and now she's on four national boards, and it's and just... And I do this so that our voice is not lost. I do this so that when they're talking about doing research, that they need to understand that if they get it wrong, they ruin it for everyone that follows. And so they have to get it right. And so um, geography is not a barrier. And this is all of the different places that we've gone in the 14 years that, that Native American outreach has been in existence. And I think it's important to let you know that we don't go anywhere unless we're invited. And we've been invited to Canada travel uh, with um, Edmund, Ed, Mameo Beach, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, with the Cree Nation. Yeah, with the Cree Nation. So the medicine man who comes over from Canada that works with the um, with the Cree Chippewa Cree. The Chippewa Cree <coughs> asked us to come up, and so we said yes, and we went through ceremony. Oh my goodness, ceremony for four days um, with him. It was an amazing experience. It was intense. Yes, very intense. Some of these medicine people are very intense. Yes. <laughs> it's wonderful, though. And, and at the beginning of my presentation, when I was talking about um, intertrans in inter collaboration, transdisciplinary collaboration, I talked about the International Rural Network how, um, Health Work. 
And I asked, and I wanted to talk about this because Phyllis was invited to Australia to um, present and teach them how to educate the Aborigines on. To tell them to, they found out about us and found out what we do, and there's just two of us and the budget that we work off of, and they wanted to know how to do it. So I went, I went down and oh, this is what you do. You get in the car and you go. <laughs> And this is how we travel. Um, we have a Jeep that's um, 14 years old, and it's still running. It's still running. Um, of course, ATV, we, like we said, we use Angel Flight quite a bit, sometimes go on the state plane. But my favorite is the in Alaska going on a dog sla sled on the Kobuk River, you know, and to a different little bush out there. Because we go in the wintertime when it's snowy as heck they don't get out and so I've got a captive audience and I'm the party. <laughs> I get to you know, bring and do stuff and give stuff. I ship stuff up and we're the party. And then it's cancer. Yes, we're going to talk about cancer. <laughs> so it's a lot of fun. I mean, you know, you take advantage of the weather. Most people won't go. It's like, oh yeah. We so were very lucky that we had someone that we collaborated with who was just magnificent. She, I'd say this is where we want to go and she'd take us and on this particular slide, I don't know how it happened, but Lynn was just inundated with snow. She got all the snow in so I'm the front. <laughs> and so I said, okay, so go up front and with the guy. And so she went up front with the guy, and then she got it all in the back. We were, everybody else was just fine. But we have a lot of fun, you know. We're chased by moose, and, and they tell us when we fly, because we also fly bush pilots up there, dress to crash. Uh, <laughs> dress to crash? And I said, yes, you know, we'll probably get the plane down. We can get the plane down, but we can't keep you, we have to keep you safe for surviving the, el the elements. Mm -hmm. It feels beautiful, too. It's yeah. our, our job is the best job on campus. <laughs> yeah, we're really lucky. Questions, comments, and concerns. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. program and I'm wondering since you deal with a lot of different tribes how have how do you kind of incorporate their 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 language on and describing cancer do you um do you utilize a lot of that do you do you learn that as far as we don't we don't so for example we were down at Montezuma Creek and we held this big huge um uh, getting mammography, having it read. We were teaching um, breast self exams. We breast self exam. And here's a good example of exactly what you're talking about. And so we had Shamas coming in who didn't speak English. And we made sure, we made sure that um, Montezuma Creek knew who was coming and if they needed translators to please bring them in and help us with that. Mm -hmm. And so she, she has her, her translator working right there, you know, telling her what I'm saying. And I'm hoping that she's getting it because what we're doing is we're putting little dots on the tumors that are inside these models, on top of where these tumors are inside these models. And they're different kinds of tumors in different fields. And so you get a prize if you get them all right. Mm. She got them all right. <laughs> so that tells me, that told me that wherever I go, they need to, whoever I work with, it's important that they understand that if they work with people who, who do not speak English well, that they provide that service for their people. But is there like a, a cultural understanding of what describing the disease is? Like what sometimes, sometimes no, because every, every single tribe has a different mm -hmm. explanation. For it. We don't have the word cancer. No one, there's mm -hmm. not a tribe that has a translation for cancer. It's the disease that won't heal. It's the disease that kills. There's so many different words for it. We don't use those words when we're there. They tell us what they are, because we always have someone there to, for us to make sure that they understand what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And then we're educating those workers. We're bringing what we know to them, and we're always a resource for them. Like the grant that took place in Montezuma Creek, 
when mine expired, I sat down, I went to Montezuma Creek, wrote the grant again, and gave it to them. There was no need for me to take it. They were doing a great job. Utah Navajo Health Systems does an incredible job of serving their people. So that's the example, really, is it's really, it's really um, uh, dependent upon the tribe. So this is kind of a broader question, mm -hmm. but I wanted the pediatricians, the primary children. Uh -huh. And so I have a family that came from Arizona to the city area mm -hmm. recently, and uh, they were in Navajo. And uh, we kind of worked through the cult what parents' cultural understanding of their child's condition was, and I won't go into great detail about that. But it became clear that part of what needed to happen before the, um, we moved on with planning was that there was a certain ceremony, the basket ceremony needed to happen. But I had no resources, knowledge, or do you have resources for us that, that we can call upon? You can call, but I can't guarantee that they will come. I have someone up at McKady in ICU. And she's Navajo, and she wanted a Navajo medicine man. Now, when that comes up for me, it's a very different connotation than just someone who, who is very different. The medicine people that I grew up with are essentially off the grid, and that's all they do. And so I put out my calls to my people with no response. And so that may happen. Yes. But you get to tell them that, that, we're, that we're trying. And if they do answer the call, then you, you get as close to what they need. And sometimes they just need to know that this is the person that everyone else is using. And sometimes it's not, they're not Navajo, but they show up, and that satisfies them as well. I think, yeah, at this point, it wouldn't matter too much. Like, just to be looking towards yeah. a, a Native solution. And sometimes we are the solution, and we'll bring our little medicine bag, and I'll bring corn, depending on what tribe it is, and I ask usually the family. And so we bring things for them to hang on to their bed, and things for them to use. Do you have cards here today? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So were they from to the city then? Yes. So there are hospitals out there that have Native programs. Right. So if you reach out to some of those hospitals, they might have... In local individuals they can refer you to as well. So I tried and we were stuck because we could not transfer the child. She was here in Salt Lake. Oh. She, she needed resources here in Salt Lake. Here. Yeah. yeah. You no, know, once they go back home it's usually okay. It's when they're here in the area. And like I said, we have people that we call. There are some Navajo translators available too. I'm one of them. I get called to the hospital sometimes just because they have a family. I think you know, would be available as well. So there are some, some resources in, in town, especially for Navajo people, because I know that um, they have referrals like down to the University of Arizona or Albuquerque, that if there aren't any beds, they will send to Salt Lake City. So those are some of the people that I've seen. And do you want ours um, so that I can get with you as well? Yes. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about, oh, sorry. Can you tell us a little bit about the, um, na the new Native American hospital I heard in for the Cherokee, I think, but... I know nothing about it. I just, I, I um, heard about it and they had pictures and everything of that. It's brand new open like about a month or two ago. Oh, well, I didn't know that. I'll look into it because the person, my contact at Cherokee has gone back to Mississippi Choctaw. So I'm not directly in contact with them. I'm sorry, you had a question. Oh, yeah. And then I you mentioned you told that about 78% of the Native American population live in urban community, and that means that about 22% live in the reservation. Mm -hmm. And uh, how compare the rate of cancer in those uh, that live in the reservation with? With the overall, with the overall? That's something that I don't do. I don't look at those statistics. When I go to a reservation, I make contact and ask them what they want me to do once they, once they ask for us. I don't look at those statistics. Um, we do have the Utah Cancer Registry that might be able to be more specific about what's, what is happening on the reservation itself because there's, in some of the reservations have no cancer control programs that actually collect that data. The IHS facility will 
but it's not necessary if they don't have a cancer control program set up I don't think that they would have that comparison because the Utah what we brought what we gave to you we pulled off of the Utah Department of Health website and they might have that I don't know the cancer program probably has through the state you can yeah. Utah, Utah the, cancer the Utah Network. registry um, tells us that cancer is not a problem among the Indian populations in the state of Utah but um, and we're supposed to have one of the best um, registries in the country yeah the Navajo do um, but it may be the way you know these um, data are reported uh, because we're considered the tribes in Utah are considered part of the Phoenix area office, so there might be some reporting to Arizona. I don't know, but yeah. But when you look at that data, cancer is not a problem in, in the populations in Utah. And that's what they tell us. Yes. I, I, and I'm sorry, I joined late. So that's I okay. I already talked about it when I walked in the room, but. Uh, something uh, is, is related to, to this question. Do you have any evidence of when cancer start appearing in, in the Native American people? Is it when they start moving outside of the reservation and eating no. food or that, or it was an historic thing? It, it, there is anthropological record of seeing tumors on bones. Yeah. So it's been here, even before contact. And the other thing is, uh, do you have any uh, traditional uh, Conventional or recipes or traditional Indian native, I mean, medicine or remedies that were used to treat certain cancers, or there is no, uh, there is nothing other than our traditional. Medicine. So the best, the best place for that is in Alaska that I know of that I work with, and it's the Alaska Tribal Health Consortium. They have traditional Indian medicine, and they have their medicine people who have office hours, they have clinic, they have set up an entire area where they collect, they collect all of their plants, and they, it's Alaska Tribal Health Consortium. And what's the name? A-N. Alaska Native Medical Health no, the, the Alaska Medical Health Center is IHS. ATHC is the South, is Southeastern Foundation. It's the foundation. And um, Delaney, what's Delaney? Do you remember Delaney's last name? Buzz Delaney. So one of the people that we were in contact with for a very long time, his name was Buzz Delaney. There is someone else who's actually his director, but he has been there for the 15 years that I've been working with him. Is there any translation of those recipes or those, uh, or those remedies into our, our... I do know, I do know, um, when I go back to D.C., they are starting now to talk about incorporating what they know in of the traditional Indian medicine into cancer treatments. It's a new, it's a new movement. Because we started out... So is it more in the, in the nutraceutical space, or, or, or could be formulated as actual drugs, or is it natural remedies like they don't need to be regulated by that? So, so I leave Sunday for another, for another talk about this. If you will take my card and then contact me, um, and I come back on Thursday, I will ask this question. I will ask this question on what is being is what, and how it is being incorporated because I know it has started. And if there is maybe a, a, um, some some tables of discussion either at the FDA or the or in the European I'll ask. authority in terms of fast tracking these things if they're not if they're not new chemical entities so if they're proven to, to be safe based on historic use from the from the natives it shouldn't be issues as much as coming up with a new drug. And it, right, but the, you know, and then the empirical evidence that's going to have to go through all of the, all of what FDA wants us to do is a whole other story. But I will ask the question if you will contact me afterwards because I've been getting this question a lot about the incorporation of TMI, or TIM, into cancer treatment. Uh-huh. Pull this to a close. Okay. And, and, and if um, anyone has any additional questions, um, Phyllis and Lynn are glad to stay, <laughs> but there may be other people who need to leave, so I just want to well, draw this to a close. I want to let you know that our next.
um, presentation is going to be next Friday, October 23rd. Um, and Dr. Dolores Calderon is going to be speaking about indigenous ways of knowing and the provision of health care. So um, please stay, talk with Lynn and Phyllis, take a look at their exhibit. There's also um, additional information on the table as you go out, um, a flyer and um, other information about the exhibit. So um, please stay. Yeah, our business cards, if you want them, are up here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.